All right, welcome back. You haven't run for the woods. So we're gonna take time to do a further analysis, a deeper analysis, and dig in deep to this piece away in a manger. And we're gonna learn some really cool things, um, things that we've discussed. We're gonna here see some clarifications on some of the concepts we've learned, but we're gonna also learn about some really resourceful tools that composers use in creating a composition. We're gonna take this slowly because I really wanna take time to dig into what's happening. We really first and foremost will give you a great foundation and understanding, a practical understanding of the concepts we've already discussed up until this point. But it's gonna give us time to really discuss some of the other cool things that are happening if we just take this phrase by phrase. For your convenience, I'm also gonna split this up between different videos to give you a chance to step away, take a break, and not have to come and find the next phrase that we're gonna discuss and the new concepts that we're gonna explore. But this will be the longest video of that segment just because we're gonna see a lot of really cool things happen really right away that we need to establish a foundation towards. So on the bottom left hand side of your screen, you're gonna see our very first phrase. And I'm gonna play parts of this to give you a really great opportunity to hear what's going on. But just to give you more of a, a spoiler, we're gonna learn things about passing tones in this section. You're gonna see really the true relationship of our two and our seven chord as substitutes for the dominant and why they become substitutes and why they're such great substitutes for the dominant. And you're gonna see how we use a substitute ultimately as part of a cadence. And you're gonna see where we can have two arguments on what harmony is actually being created with a dominant or is it a seven? So strap in, we're gonna have some fun and let's go ahead and get the beginning. So the first thing that we look at as a composer or as a, a music theorist when we're looking at a piece of music, we wanna see what key are we in? So I see that we have a B flat and so that indicates that I'm gonna probably be in F major now, there's a chance I could be in D minor, which is the relative minor, but seeing as how, at least up into this series, we haven't talked about minor keys, it's gonna be pretty safe in this piece, it's gonna be a major key. And when we do our analysis, you're gonna see, in fact, we're in F major. The next thing that we're gonna look at is the time signature. That's always a good thing to take a look at to see, understand rhythmically, what's happening in this piece. And you're gonna see that we're gonna be in three, four time. That means we're gonna get three beats in a measure, and the quarter note gives us that beat. The first thing you're gonna notice though when you go to do your analysis is that, hey, wait a minute, that first measure has just one beat. What's going on there? And if you were to scan ahead to the end of that phrase, you're like, wait a minute, that measure only has two beats. What's going on? Well, what's going on is that the composer has elected to do what's called a pickup. And what that means is we're stealing the last beat of each phrase to begin each phrase. And that pickup, in most cases, we don't analyze because it's not really creating a harmony as you'll see here, and I'm gonna play it for you. It's just giving us a lead in to our melody. So let's take a look at this pickup. We have in the left hand, a C and a C, and we have that same C that we play in the left hand repeated. We really have this octave, this open sound. There's not really a harmony, meaning multiple notes to analyze. It's just one note, C. So you might ask, why did I put a little five down there underneath the pickup? Well, the reason why I put that there is because of the bass movement to our next harmony, our real harmony, when we start the piece of music for reals. And you'll see that we, the next harmony starts with an F in the bass, and whenever we're analyzing a harmony, we always start in the bass to see what inversion we're in. And so we know that tonic, F major, starts on an F. And lo and behold, in our left hand, in our bass, our very first note, bottom up, it starts with an F. So I have F, A, C, F, which are the three notes, F, A, C, makes our F major chord, which is our tonic. And when I go back to my pickup, I see I have this motion in my bass. Let's hear it again. So without having to do 
any additional analysis and without having to have any additional harmonies to create any chord structures, that is something I can recognize. I know that this is a 5-1 movement. And that is a very big characteristic of a perfect authentic cadence, in fact, of going from root 5 to root 1 in the bass. So I'm comfortable putting that as a 5. So we've already analyzed the pickup. We've taken a look at our very first chord, our very first harmony of FAC in root position. And again, when you start a piece of music, you're going to notice and as you analyze more music, especially with tonal music specifically, you're going to start off in root position, in tonic of the key that you've chosen. You're not going to analyze pieces and see it in first inversion, say A, C, F and start a piece off that way. You're gonna always see root position, F, A, C. And this is done for a reason. Composers in tonal music are really wanting to establish the key that they're in. And the way they do that is by establishing it in root position. And throughout the piece, you might get inversions later where you're in first inversion or second inversion. But to start the piece, you're gonna always be in root. Now this is really where we get an opportunity for interpretation. And some interesting things are happening in the very next beat, the third beat of this, of this measure, of this really full first measure. And you're gonna see in the left hand we have a C, you're gonna see a B flat, and then in my left hand, in my right hand I've got in my alto a D, and in my soprano I've got a G. Now, it sounds good, but then in my very next movement, I've got this, and I'm not sure really what to make of it. But you've noticed that I put, as the chord, the indicator, a 5-7. Now we haven't really had a chance to discover, uh, discuss seven chords, but basically a seven chord is built off of the interval seven. So C to B flat would be considered a minor seventh. If it were a major seventh, it would be a B natural and it'd sound like this but it's not, it's a seven, it's a minor seven, so C to B flat, and a five seven chord would sound like this. You have C, E, G, and your seventh interval at the top, which is our B flat. So we have, if we look at the, the two eighths, uh, eighth notes that are in that section, in that beat, you do see we have the construct for a Five, seven chord. We do have the C, which starts it off. We have the B flat in there. We do have an E, and we have a G. But we have two notes that don't seem to belong. We have a D, and we have this A. And those don't belong in a 5-7 chord. So what do we do with them? So I've chosen to call it a 5-7 chord, and we're introducing in this particular portion what's called passing tones. And so I have in my alto this movement. I have away in a manger. And I have something that's passing through in those voices. And what's passing through in this is our D, the one I have circled there. Away in a on our way to our E. So the D, technically, is what we call a passing tone. It's passing from C to our E in our harmony. And so we're going to call it a passing tone. The same thing is happening, something very similar in a very different way, but it's still passing through. It's not really actually adding something to the harmony, but it's movement in our melody um, as we listen to the, the piece. So, for example, in our soprano we have Away in a manger. And our A is just really an embellishment, is what we would really call that. An embellishment is when you do maybe a trill or move around the note, but we're not centered on the note, we're embellishing it, we're making it more exciting. So our A really is not part of what we could consider the harmony. And so the notes that we have left are, in fact, C, E, G, B flat. 
And another great indicator is what I have going on in the bass. I have my C, root position for 5, and I have my B flat. And that is my characteristic 5-7 chord. So I can comfortably say 5-7. Now additionally you'll see, if I were to try to do this vertically, and then try to say on the second part of uh, the third beat, um, that particular harmony, I could maybe try to justify it as a, a three chord and first inversion. I have it in parentheses just as an idea if you were analyzing it. What I'd ultimately say though is X that out. That doesn't belong because that's not really what's happening in this. We're not changing harmonies. We're really keeping the same structure of our 5-7. And so let's hear that. We've got this in the bass. We have away in a manger. We have this very clear 5-1-5-1 progression, and we have this B flat to give us that additional seventh, really great sound. And so we can say, well, we've got away in the manger, and I'll stop singing to it so that way you can hear it even clearer. And you hear how that really is a 5-7. But let's take a closer look because I mentioned that we're going to learn even in this very first phrase really to see how the relationship of the 2 and the 7 as substitutes play into this. So what is a 2 chord in F major? Well we have G, B flat, and D. And we actually find those in that group or cluster of notes. We do have a G, we do have a B flat, and we do have a D. Now there are notes that don't seem to belong, like the A and the C, but that's definitely our two chord. Right there, hidden in our 5-7. And so if we were to play a 5-7 and extend it to a ninth, well we have our two chord right in there. We have G, B flat, D, and we just added E and C. Very interesting. So let's take a look at our 7 chord in F major, which would be E, G, B flat, right? We have our tritone. But then we also, if we were to make this a 7 chord, so adding a 7, we would add a D. Very interesting. So I actually have that 7 chord, E, G, B flat, specifically in my 5-7 if I were to add the C. Huh. And so you can see how that 7 and that 2 chord actually work very well as substitutes for the 5 because they're actually part of an extended 5 chord. They're part of that 5-7 or 5-9. So we're going to stop here because we've talked to quite a bit. We're going to pick up in the next video. But now we've had a chance to see, even just within a measure and a pickup, how much we've already been able to explore about a piece of music. And we haven't had to put that much work into it yet. So I'm excited to see you in the next video. See you there.